you come to prayer with me? Loving and gracious God, you are the one who continues to show us the unconditional love in our lives, and you allow us to fulfill God's perfect will when we're unable to. And never leaving us behind and allowing us to see what the true meaning of our Lenten journey will be over this season. So as we journey over the cross, be with us now and through the gifts that you give us each and every day. I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts. Be they ever acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So last week we started our Lenten series called Following the Question. Those questions that we've asked as we seek and to grow as we follow Jesus. And we started last week with the question, who do we come from? And through that message last week, we were reminded that we have a shared family history as people of God. And no matter what our personal ethics or our cultural or family histories are, that in Christ we've all been adopted into one spiritual story. A story which is of God at work, of God's people, and as the people of the story, we are shaped by a spiritual legacy that speaks to our past, our present, and our future as we follow Jesus. And our leading question this morning may seem a bit similar to that of the one we asked last week, but it takes a few steps in a further direction. We're being asked this morning, who's on our team? So who is on our team today or right now? So if last week is about what makes us who we are and what grounds our identity, then this week we're going to try and recognize how we are able to move forward together along with the, what Jesus is doing as well as through doing through us. But we need to take note that the question is, who is on our team, not who are your people? Because just as human nature, that those two questions could direct us in two different directions with totally different answers. If I was to pose the question, who are your people? I'm sure what would come into mind would be the people in your inner circle, your family, your friends, your tribe, the people who are most likely to be exactly like you. Often our people are those people in this particular season of life actually having a handle on who we really are and who we naturally understand who our joys and our struggles are due to that human nature, but we always will quickly divide into different kinds of segmented tribes. And the reason why our question today is who is on our team is because every team is put together by an individual, whether a coach or a team captain, for all intents and purposes in order to accomplish this, every team needs to be comprised of people with a variety of different gifts, which are united to one common purpose. For example, in order to achieve a full bodied sound, one needs a bass, a tenor, an alto or soprano, along with melody and harmony. While a football team needs both defensive and offensive players. Baseball team needs their infielders and their outfielders. But truth be had, we all need people in our lives who get us. Now, as followers of Jesus, our team is more than our people. And as the book of Revelation reveals that Jesus' team is made up of people of every race and every tribe and every tongue and every nation and that Jesus' team are the people that are brought together not because of our uniformity of each other, but through our unity in Jesus. So when we are looking toward Jesus for our hope and our purpose, 
that we might just be surprised and discover that everyone else who is looking to Jesus from that place that they're standing is probably vastly different from what we are. As we know, Jesus has a way of drawing these teammates into his mission in a way that's bigger and diverse than ever known of our own viewpoints. And so as we look at this question today, who is on our team? I think we need to explore some other questions that build into this particular question. As questions, what makes us a team? What is the purpose of this team? And why does it even matter that we recognize our own teammates? What does it make to have us be a good team? Well, in the history of the people of God and up to this point, it was Team Yahweh and was largely the team of ethnic uniformity. The Hebrew people of 12 different tribes and those people who joined the team were noticeable. And we see their names listed in the stories as you go through the scriptures. You see, these people were so used to understanding Team Yahweh as a family thing. You were either born into or not. But when people told Jesus his mother and brothers were looking for him, namely the people here in that group, Jesus answered, as we heard in our gospel reading this morning, Who is my mother? Who are my kin? Pointing to the disciples, Jesus said to them, This is my family. Whoever does the will of Abba God in heaven is my sister and my brother and my mother. This Team Yahweh membership isn't about what you have been born into. Rather, what is born in by our faith. Because God the Creator, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit through Jesus Open that way for each of us to be a part of God's team. Jesus made the Abba known to us and calls us to join this particular mission in inviting the world to be on this particular team. So then, what is the purpose of this particular team? Or better yet, what is that will of God? I believe that it is best answered if we go right into Scripture. And if you go into John chapter 6, around verses 37, we hear the following. Don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Pardon, and you'll be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. A full measure packed down, shaken together, and running all over, it will be poured into your lap for the amount you measure and the amount you measure out is the amount that you'll be given back. It's also told in a parable that can a blind person act as a guide to someone who is blind? Won't they both fall into a ditch? The student is not above the teacher but the students will once they are fully trained be on a par with their teacher. So if this is the will of God drawing all the people into eternal life, by looking to Jesus as the Son and believing in him, then what does that look like? And we got that answer this morning in the epistle lesson, but we heard, for it confesses you with your lips that Jesus is the sovereign and believe it in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You will be saved Faith in the heart leading and putting into the righteousness of God, confessing on our lips our deliverance. It is said that no one who believes in God will be put to shame. But here there is a difference between the Jew and the Greek and have the same creator that the rich in the mercy towards all who call, that everyone who calls on the name of the Most High will be saved. Jesus alone chose to enter into death to make it a way for life for all of us. So that it is truly that will of God that when, when then would, would be our role. And how does our role then fall into this particular team? What is our part as we move forward? 
well, this particular part of the mission is going to take people who can speak to Jesus who are different and who are different effectively. There is that grace in every corner of the world to reach every corner of the world. And then Jesus calls his people from those vastly different corners of life to become that part of the team. So then you might say, then why does it matter that we recognize our teammates? We know for a team to function well, it has to be both diverse and gifting, as well as united in purpose. And it also needs to respect the differences of inside that make it strong, while also pursuing together, reaching the goal. I think it's difficult for us to see what Jesus sees in people who are not like us come through and say that they're not sure. And believe it or not, the original disciples had those same issues. <clears throat> A group of 12 disciples that Jesus called to follow him, who at the same time didn't always get one another because they were a very diverse group. We have to note, however, that they were all there because Jesus had called upon them and because they wanted more than anything to know more about Jesus. I'm going to show you a segment of a movie called The Chosen, where it actually is a depiction of the calling of Matthew. This is just one filmmaker's idea of what it might have looked like for those early disciples. Mother of a son with talent like yours should be proud. She's ashamed that I could use the talent that God gave me against God. Next, you're good at something. You found a way to make a living doing it. It's that simple. Must be nice to live in a world so simply ordered. We live in the same world, Matthew. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Going 
Don and Matthews for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't recognize the one character, that was Peter, who was questioning Jesus. Peter and Matthew may have never come together as friends. They may have never been each other's people. But they came to see that they were both Jesus' people, which made them become teammates who used their very gifts. So then, why does it matter then who we recognize who is on our team? It matters because it points us back to who is the head of our team. And what is the purpose of that team is more about the unity rather the, than the uninformity. If you look further into John's Gospel, around chapter 17, Jesus prayed a prayer that we, that we use as the people that would be one, as both as he and the Abba are the one in spirit. Now that we could be the same, but then we would be unified for a purpose. And in love, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, we hear Jesus pray the following. My prayer is not for them alone, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And that all of them may be one Abba, just as you are in me, and may they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me, I have given them the glory that you gave me. And that may be the one of as who we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world would know then you sent me and then have loved them, even as you have loved me. So our unity in Christ alone and so why is it important that we know who is on our team? So that we don't make the, make the mistake of trying to define ourselves so narrowly on these earthly tribes that we miss the beauty of being a part of that greater team Jesus and the greater impact in the, in the world. If you read further into Romans around chapter 12, and I'm not going to go and read you all of that, that you'll see that there are a whole lot of coaching advice given to the church in this particular chapter. And in that coaching, we see a mix of advice given for those on the team and for those who aren't on the team. Look at it as your teammates are the one of those others that you see in romance. Be devoted to one another in love honor one another, live in harmony with one another. Why? Because your teammates need your encouragement, your support and your commitment to be walking this road together because we have been made that family of Jesus whether we like it or not. Whether you have anything else in common or not. Now, we live into this through the Holy Spirit that begins to teach us some powerful things about who he is within the church and in the world and through Jesus and through this we learn about that unity that comes from Jesus, who sees what we need and who is there to answer that need. The disciples of Jesus are called to walk together while following Jesus and if you kept reading through Romans, we see the instructions also seamlessly flow into Team Jesus that were meant to interact with the world throughout the days of our lives, but at the same time to know how to act toward those who aren't our teammates. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourning with those who mourn. Be willing to deal with people who are in low positions. Do not repay any evil for evil. And as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. But do not overcome by the evil that is overcome. And do this, why? Because that's what Jesus does. And because we love just as Jesus first loved us, 
that we also know this because that no one is ever reprimanded or argued into love. Our love changes the heart. And if you're on our team, you know that you're here due to any other things that any of our own performance, but rather we are here to be adopted into it and the price that has already been paid to make us family. Because our place has been secured by that work that Jesus did for each and every one of us. And so as we look into the eyes and faces of those who are looking at Jesus, as we go into the week ahead, look around your world. What do you see within your teammates? Are you encouraging one another to engage in that same mission of love in the world? So until next week, when we ask the question, what's the problem? Blessings upon each and every one of you this morning. Amen.